For those who are watching, I'll do a screen share here. You can see there are 20, they're grouped a number of ways, but these are things that many of you may recognize. Alanine, glycine, isoleucine, leucine, proline, valine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine, aspartic acid, uh, aspartate, glutamic acid, glutamate, arginine, histidine, glutamine, asparagine, methionine, cysteine, threonine, serine, lysine, and as I mentioned, selenocysteine. Now, these are incorporated based on the genetic code that is laid out on mRNA fragments. I'm showing on the screen a picture of translation. So here's an mRNA, which is transcribed from DNA. You have this uh, set of codons, these three uh, base pairs that link up to base pairs on a tRNA, a transfer RNA, which carries an amino acid. So this is important because these tRNAs are very specific for the amino acids they carry. And the anti-codon on the tRNA matches up with the codon on the mRNA. And that is how you make a protein out of an mRNA. You are making an amino acid chain from a chain of base pairs on mRNA, which ultimately came from DNA. So this is really important. These tRNAs, there's a tRNA for these amino acids. These tRNAs are very specific for these amino acids. And what we will find is that some of these non-protein amino acids, essentially defense chemicals by very, very savvy plants, trick these tRNAs into carrying their amino acid, which is not actually supposed to be in the protein, in place of the amino acid that should be there. And that leads to proteins with the wrong amino acids that don't fold properly, and that may be at the root of neurodegeneration. It's a fascinating hypothesis. It's very, very interesting, but this is the process of translation the coding of an mRNA into a protein, the amino acid chain made with these tRNAs that pair up to codons, anticodons. That's very important to understand if you're gonna understand what we're gonna talk about next. So let's look at this paper, which is quite detailed and a good reference for you guys. This is from Kenneth J. Rogers uh, at, um, in Australia. He's at the, the School of Medical and Molecular Biosciences and the University of Technology in Sydney, Australia. And as he says here in the abstract, animals in common with plants and microorganisms synthesize proteins from a pool of 20 amino acids, which we talked about, plus selenocysteine and pyrolysine. Okay. This represents a small proportion, less than 2% of the total number of amino acids known to exist in nature. Many non-protein amino acids are synthesized by plants and in some cases constitute part of their chemical armory against pathogens, predators, or species competing for the same resources. Hmm. That's quite interesting. Now, if you see here, what he goes on to say is that um, they have clear potential to adversely affect human health. In this review, we explore the links between exposure to non-protein amino acids and neurodegenerative disorders in humans. Environmental factors may play a major role in these complex disorders, which are predominantly sporadic. The discovery of new genes associated with neurodegenerative diseases, many of which code for aggregation-prone proteins continues at a spectacular pace, but little progress is being made in identifying the environmental factors that impact these disorders. We make the case that these insidious entry, that the insidious entry of non-protein amino acids into the human food chain and the incorporation of the protein might be contributing significantly to neurodegenerative damage. That is a pretty compelling hypothesis. That is fascinating. If you guys read my book, The Carnivore Code, you know that there are some other really interesting hypotheses regarding neurodegenerative disorders, specifically Parkinson's, BRAC and Hawks hypothesis. I won't go into detail about that here. You can reference the book, but that involves lectins and the fact that there is a series of studies done in C. elegans, a worm, and in mice and rats, showing that if you introduce specific lectins into these animals and you label them fluorescently, you can see the lectins move from the gut through the vagus nerve in a retrograde fashion to the brain, to the striatum, the substantia nigra of the brain, in which they are associated with uh, issues in the striatum, in the dopamine, do dopaminergic neurons of the basal ganglia in the, um, the Parkinson affected regions of the brain in these animal models. And that is a very fascinating thing to think that lectins could move retrograde from the gut to the brain, become deposited there and cause neurodegeneration or misfolding of proteins. So this is one compelling hypothesis for at least Parkinson, uh, Parkinsonism. And there is another, uh, correlate to that in terms of uh, epidemiology, there is a large study, I believe in Denmark, of people who had super selective versus truncal vagotomy of the vagus nerve, meaning cutting the uh, major branches of the vagus nerve versus cutting only selective branches of the vagus nerve, which is one of the major nerves that can move compounds and signals in an anterograde or retrograde fashion from the stomach to the brain or vice versa. And when it's doing that, if you cut 
the vagus nerve. If you do a truncal vagotomy, those people have a much lower incidence of Parkinson's disease in the Danish population. How curious is that? Could it be that this is happening in humans, that lectins, uh, predominantly from these leguminous foods, from beans and seeds, maybe moving retrograde fashion, ending up in the dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra in the brain and causing motor disorders. Well, that's one hypothesis, which I think is compelling. Again, that focuses on lectins from beans. And this one is talking about non-protein amino acids, which can occur in these type of foods. And they are well known in human populations and in animal models to cause issues. So there are multiple hypotheses, but they're all pointing to the problems with seeds. Plants do not want their seeds to be eaten. There are many defense chemicals. This is just one of them. If we go back to the paper that I just showed by Kenneth J. Rogers, and we go to the section, specific effects of proteomimetic amino acids on human health. The first one that he talks about is the L-tyrosine mimetic L-dopa present in the seeds from the highly insect-resistant Central American plants of the genus Macuna, like Macuna prurens. This, interestingly, is something that Andrew Huberman has talked about with regard to dopamine signaling and um, perhaps using Macuna as a supplement to get L-dopa. But for this podcast, I was texting with him more and he said he's not a fan of Macuna because it causes massive dumps uh, of dopamine or energy, probably because you don't want to get lots of L-dopa into your system. L-dopa is a non-protein amino acid present in the seed of this plant, Macuna. The genus Macuna, Macuna prurens is one of these. And what we know is that incorporation of a proteomimetic amino acid into proteins is a random process. And although no specific proteins are targeted, aggregation prone or intrinsically disordered proteins, such as alpha-synuclein or tau protein could be more sensitive to amino acid substitution. Those are proteins involved in neurodegenerative disorders. If you go further in this paper, what you will see is that in patients who have been given L-DOPA for Parkinsonism, we find the presence of L-DOPA incorporated into proteins. It's very clear. L-DOPA might accelerate the progression of Parkinson's. Proteins containing incorporated L-DOPA are present in the blood and brain extracts from L-DOPA related, excuse me, L-DOPA treated individuals. When present in proteins or other polymers, L-DOPA is one of nature's most effective adhesives and cross-linking agents and is, a, is capable of generating protein aggregates in cells, preventing their removal by proteolysis. Hmm. That is not good. So the question that must then be asked, which is going to drive, you know, mainstream medicine crazy is, is this, is using L-DOPA, is using a non-protein amino acid derived from plants helping or hurting Parkinsonism long-term? Well, in the short term, it may help because the L-DOPA may be a precursor for dopamine. In, Parkinson, in Parkinson's disease, these dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra are destroyed essentially by some sort of autoimmune process. We don't fully understand the process. Perhaps it's related to lectins, perhaps it's related to something else, but we give L-DOPA back to give a precursor for dopamine. And this may help with movement because dopamine is one of these neurotransmitters that is essential for movement. But in doing so, we are giving L-DOPA, which may be incorporated. In fact, we know it is incorporated into brains, uh, brain tissue and other blood uh, borne proteins in these patients. And that leads to aggregation and misfolding of these proteins. Could that also be accelerating Parkinsonism Yes, it could be, which is, I think, a kind of a sad story because L-DOPA is one of the mainstays of treatment of the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So what do we do? Well, in my belief, we look for the root cause of Parkinson's. We stop using pharmaceuticals and we're careful about what we're doing. And we ask the questions, what is really the root cause of Parkinson's disease? And we ask the hard questions, which may be quite controversial, but there are compelling hypotheses that compel us, double compel us to ask these questions. Specifically, is it possible that lectins in our diet or something else in our diet is triggering an autoimmune reaction, which is leading to degradation or damage to these stridal neurons, neurons in the brain leading to Parkinson's disease. It's a scary thought. 